Lead code is a website you would have heard a lot about, but what if I tell you that I'm going to show you how to build a website like lead code in this video, let's just explore how we built lead code internally for our use case at Formion, what this exactly means and how this actually works on a technical level. Maybe you can take away a few insights. This architecture, which I'm going to show you is going to be different than other open source architectures, which you will find generally available for the reason. Also, I'll tell you why that is, but in this video, it's it's gonna be a deep dive into how an architecture of a website like lead code works and how we made it work in our use case so first things first before we get into technical implementation i want to show you and talk a little bit about how this thing works and why we have developed it in the first place so i'm working on this platform called as fermion which you can go on fermion.app it's a platform built for technical content creators and boot camps who want to launch their businesses online with their own branding, with their own content, coding courses, assessments, all of that. And one of the things that we provide, which most other platforms do not provide is the built-in coding labs and assessments technology. Now this technology is not unique. Obviously there are things like GitHub workspaces. There are things like lead code. Also, there are things like hacker rank, but what if you want to do this under your own branding? And what if you want to do it in a very specific way? I'll show you that. So in that case, you can use Fermion as a SaaS platform. Platform. So let's talk about how this works in Fermion, right? So I'm inside a dummy school, which is available. I'm going to go ahead into manage features and I'm going to enable coding labs right now, which is disabled, right? So on Fermion, we provide two types of coding labs. The first kind of a lab is a full blown coding environment like VS code, which is how code damn labs also work. If you have seen the second kind of labs is the IO lab, which is the one which I'm going to talk about in this video, the architecture and how this all works. We're going to cover interactive lab also, maybe in some video in future but let's talk about IO lab first. Let's say I create a basic IO lab first of all. So let's say echo back STDIN, right? Maybe, you know, it's as simple as it can get. So I create an IO lab, not an interactive lab and I customize this lab. So how an IO lab interface works today, it's very simple. It's relatively simple. We have just released this product, but how this works is let's say you create a writer program that echo backs, whatever you write in STDIN. Right now over here, it's a very simple program statement, but this would, you know, you can start to feel that this is how a problem statement on lead code will also be created. You have a specific problem title, problem description. Then you add a bunch of test cases. You figure out what language is allowed. For example, let's say you enable all of them. You don't enable SQLite, obviously. So we have some work to do here. It's like, they are just enums, which are just spitted out over here. We can just beautify this a bit. But once you enable these languages, you can add test cases. Let's say I add a test case hello and then expected output is also hello then i enter add another test case called world the expected output is also world right you mark the first test case as sample and you go ahead and save this so over here you can also see there are a few configuration options which we'll also talk about how what these means and how they work so let me just go ahead and try out this lab first of all so once i try this out you're going to see that we get a basic interface where i can select a language of my choice which again is something you enabled over here and i have these test cases which are available so test case one which was the sample test case it's automatically available rest of the test cases are locked right which is the only other one so let's just go ahead and shift to node.js for example and over here the boilerplate code automatically includes stdin so pretty much i guess all we have to do over here is just write console log stdin or in fact not console log because it prints a new line by default let's just write process.stdout.write and then stdin Right. So now if I go ahead and run this, you're going to see that it starts to run the first test case, which is the only test case, which was there. And it actually matches it. Right. So the input output and expected output is same. So test case is passed. Let's say if I add another test case, which is like just for me to check. And if I add the same thing, you can see I can run this and I can see now there are two test cases which are running and they will pass or fail depending on, you know, whatever my program does. Finally, once I'm done, I can also submit this. When you are submitting it, it would run all the system level test cases, right? So it's not running my own custom test cases now. It's just running system level test cases and this thing works. This is exciting and this is something which you can now add in courses, in contests. So on Fermion, what you can also do is create these contests, which let's say if you're creating a DSA level or 
a you know some sort of contest where people have to take part in you can set up these labs right this is the use case of performion and this is why we built this now let's talk about how this actually works so over here we have this interface right so this lab interface which is a simple web app that just has this monaco editor nothing fancy going on over here it's a basic next.js react app right however when you press this run button or a submit button we do something what we do is that we make a backend call to our backend servers right so this is our backend api which stores this task which registers that you have requested a run so what it does is that it registers that a run is requested that is why you see that there is a delay in the result of what you write versus what you get so you can see over here when i click on this run it first of all goes to the scheduled mode right so a scheduled mode is just a mode where it has registered that a request has been made after that if you look carefully when i click on this run you can see that this information appears slightly later so the reason it appears slightly later is because the pipeline is that this task is then picked up by a runner right and we have a lot of runners right so we have runner one we have runner two we have runner three and so on right so this task is picked by either one of these runners obviously not everyone picks it up directly but any one of these runners would pick up this task which the backend has registered so this delay which you see over here in clicking this run so the scheduled and the difference between scheduled and running is the difference of time it takes to runner for a runner to pick up this task from backend now you might ask where are these runners what are these runners exactly doing and you know how is this working how is this architecture working because hey mehul you also told me that initially in the video this architecture is different from how you will find it in open source and i'll tell you how this is different because these runners which you see over here these are the same runners that also powers the infrastructure for interactive labs so what i mean by that is if i go to codedam.com slash problems again just to show you an example let's say I shift to react chess problems and let's say I open this hover counter so when I'm opening this you see that there's a container getting provisioned right on a physical machine somewhere in the cloud so this command which is just running yarn install in yarn dev if I create another terminal let's say I'm writing all this Linux command this is getting executed somewhere in the cloud now these commands are running inside these runners over here inside a small container right so this is c1 there is c2 there's another container and so on and so forth so what's exactly what's technically happening is that when you are running a coding lab which is an io lab right so if i go back to the interface where we were practicing so if i go back and try out this lab the moment i click on this run button what's happening is that because we already have these runners provisioned for running the actual playgrounds right because playgrounds is also one of our major use cases where people use playgrounds to practice and they use playgrounds to run full-blown environments inside browser right so they use this all the time so because we already have this compute at hand and for obviously for you know stability purposes no single runner is at at full capacity at any time because if it is then we just boot a new runner right for playgrounds part so what we do is that we reuse or rather we try to use the capacity which is under provision right so we try to use a runner which is under provision and we execute these runs over here right so let's say this runner 2 is only running three containers so it's going to do is that it's going to say that hey backend i am available if you want me to run this dsa task let me just go ahead and quickly spin up a container over here which is going to be a special type of container let's say this is d1 so it's not like a c container which is like a code dam container let's say but it's a d container which is like a dsa container so instead of spinning up a c4 over here it just spun c1 or d1 as a container it's gonna run this task which is gonna take very small time right because you know that these dsa tasks they are over within like a second or a couple of seconds so it runs this task it sends back the output to the back end and the back end obviously just stores it and it sends it back again so if you look at our inspect element also while this is happening what you're gonna see is that if i run this task you're gonna see uh, i just have to disable cache because it performs a lot of course requests also in general so if i run this task again first task gets registered now we poll for the result once every second right so we can increase this frequency but we start to poll for this from our backend and while it's polling this whole infrastructure is taking place right so this whole communication is taking place between an idle runner which we don't know like what ra that runner is or what that runner gets assigned that runner creates a container it executes it uh, executes the code 
code which you have provided over here and it returns it runs it does everything and then it returns the task to our backend actually and we show this result in your lab interface right so coming back to this interface you can also see that we have some advanced properties over here which is maximum cpu time maximum wall time maximum memory we have a few more things internally like the stack size you can customize all of that but for now these are the defaults that we provide so a cpu time is basically the time that your computer your cpu is actually being used right wall time is the total time of the execution so if you go ahead inside coding labs itself and inside compile api you will see that we also provide a mini interface on an api level so let's say if you want to do this your own uh, interface or whatever but you just need the execution and the sandboxing api right you need to just borrow this runner infra from us but you can afford to you know you just have your own mini web app or you want to create your own lead code basically if you want to do it at some point you would need an api where you can execute arbitrary code and since we already have a lot of compute lying around which we can obviously use uh, for running these low duration dsa tasks we just use that we can also rent it out to you so you can use our api this is an example of an api so for example if i just go ahead and do a console log process.env right just to see where it is running what's happening inside node.js so if i run this code the same thing is happening it registers a task on the back end it runs it and it returns it back but this api actually shows a little bit of more data right so we can see that process.env just console logging that took 55 milliseconds of cpu time in this case wall time of 79 milliseconds and this again like depends on how much time it takes to load up the whole node program in general and you know the initialization time of node.js and so on and so forth but the wall time is just 79 milliseconds cpu time is 55 milliseconds and the memory used is 10248 kb if you run this on a hot node.js instance obviously the cpu time and wall time would be much lower but because this starts from the very cold like it's a cold boot it's a cold start that's why every time you do it it'll take about 50 to 60 milliseconds of cpu time right so this is the output that we get again like nothing exciting about here because it's running inside a sandbox environment so you can't do anything over here but you get an idea right so if i do a python for example and if i just do print one and if i run this code you can like you know compare like in a sandbox environment at least in fermion python starts relatively faster for some reason than node.js i have no idea why that is the case but yeah you can try and you can experiment with these things so you can also pass in like c code c plus plus code so if you do like printf one like this I think this would work. It's been some time since I wrote some C code. But if you do something like this, you can see the CPU time here is just four milliseconds, which is expected, like given that C is a compiled language and the CPU time does not account for the compilation time, only for the runtime. So that is expected. And the memory footprint is also like relatively low. So yeah, I hope you understood how this architecture which we have developed works. And because we have a lot of runners at any given point, the assumption here is that we will always have capacity to run arbitrary amount of workload obviously it will have a breaking point where you know our runners would be short in capacity if you just keep on throttling the api but we are also obviously continuously monitoring it and our systems upscales and downscales as well depending on the demand so i mean we'll be most likely fine even if you try to do like 10 or 15 requests per second on your api endpoint for executing these dsa tasks so this is how we built a basic interface for dsa that is by using our existing infrastructure for running coding labs within the browser and i hope you learned something from this video because if you did then make sure you leave a like and subscribe to the channel let me know in the comments below what do you think about this have you developed something like this before it's a relatively simple thing it's not nothing complex the complex part is just getting these fleet of runners up and running uh, which we already had solved like months ago years ago rather i would say with code dam in general and then we just reuse that existing infrastructure to run dsa as well so do check out fermion if it fits your use case you can not only just do all of this advanced things but you can also sell courses if you want you can set up your contest which can have these coding labs which i just showed you which can have these coding assessments a lot of fun stuff is available on fermion to try out you can check out analytics of the platforms by the way we charge only on bandwidth and storage that you consume and you use so there's that you don't have to pay for any additional feature or any additional thing except for the bandwidth storage and a few more metrics that you use so we're, we're kind of like versal but cheaper <laughs> obviously and uh, more efficient most likely so that's all for this one hopefully you learn something new do let me know in the comments what do you think i'm gonna see you in the next video very soon